G'day, this is Chris Savage from Ariel Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session on the book of Acts. We pray that uh, it will be a benefit to you and that you will grow, study hard and grow strong. Thank you for attending today. Last week we finished off, we have Stephen. Uh, Stephen is now uh, before the Sanhedrin. <clears throat> Last week he was, he was out in the community and uh, he was in the synagogues, especially the synagogues of the diaspora Jews. And uh, he was disputing with them about Jesus. And in the end, uh, a lot were turning to Jesus, but the rest of them got a bit cheesed off with it. So they reported him, um, you know, as he was preaching Jesus. And now he is, and remember back then too, he was doing a lot of um, miracles as well, because he was one of those, what we call apostolic legates by the laying on of hands of, of, of uh, the apostles, he could do those miraculous things as well. So he's brought before the Sanhedrin, but this time this persecution doesn't come just from the, Phar the Sadducees because they were the ones who brought the first two persecutions. This time it comes from the Pharisees as well. And the reason the Pharisees are now involved is because um, they say that uh, um, Stephen has been preaching against the law and against the temple. So we have the Sadducees with the temple. We have the Pharisees with the law. So now... In the past, it was just the, the Sadducees, but now both, both groups are now involved and we have him brought before the Sanhedrin and he has to give a defense of himself. He draws upon uh, the patriarchs, he draws upon Abraham and uh, draws upon uh, Joseph. And basically what, he, what he's saying is that, listen, you know, God just doesn't work inside the land of Israel or inside the temple. He works outside the land as well. And... Uh, Basically, he's saying, you know, with Abraham, he called him while he was far away. Um, and also with Joseph, you know, he was the one that, the, that his brothers rejected first time. But the second time, they accepted him because he became their deliverer. So now he's, he's uh, today, we're going to see that he's going to draw upon Moses. He's going to now use Moses as an example. And what he's basically doing, he's saying, listen, um, listen, guys. Have a look at our history, see in our history, God works outside the land as well as inside the land. And uh, in the past, we're going to see that, you know, the ones that you guys rejected became your deliverers. So what he's saying is, you know, you guys be careful what you do with Jesus. Okay, so here we go. We're looking at in chapter 7, verse 17. And in verses 17 to 19, uh, we're going to look at this is the Egyptian oppression. In verses 17 to 19, he deals with this, this uh, time in Egypt. And in verse 17, he begins with God's divine oppression. Remember, it was God's divine oppression. But as the time of the promise drew nigh on which God vouchsafed unto Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. And this was the, the promise that was made to Abraham that the Jews would not be in Egypt more than 400 years. And during this time, the people grew and multiplied. And at that point, in verse 18, a new Pharaoh arose in Egypt. It says, till there arose another king over Egypt who knew not Joseph. And the two Greek words that mean another carry totally different meanings. Uh, first, the first Greek word means another of the same kind. Uh, and, and second, the second Greek word means another of a different kind. And that's the term that's used here. It was another pharaoh, another king of a different kind. So what we see here is uh, at this point in, e in, in Egypt's history, what we see is that uh, um, it was, uh, sorry, it, was, uh, it wasn't simply a new king, but it was actually a new dynasty. Uh, it changed uh, from the 17th to the 18th dynasty. And what we see here is that the 16th and 17th dynasties of Egypt, they were actually not Egyptian, but they were Hyksos, H-Y-K, oh, it's on your screen there, Hyksos. And these were Semites. Uh, these were Semites who conquered Egypt and they ruled the country for two dynasties. And for those two dynasties, uh, as they were on the throne, but now we, at the time of the bondage, there was a rebellion by the native Egyptians under a man named Amosi. Amosi. 
and he became the first pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. And he overcame the Hyksos and expelled them, and he was the one who enslaved the Jews. He was a king of a different kind. It was a brand new dynasty. And remember, Joseph was from the Semite area, and the kings on the, where Joseph was when he was in the land were also Semites. But now uh, we have a different dynasty, which are not Semites. And this, this king, this king felt no need to know or to recognize what Joseph did for Egypt because Joseph, like the Hyksos, was Semite. And the Egyptians were not Semites. And because of that, uh, he felt no need to recognize any debt, any debt to Joseph's service to Egypt or to Joseph's people. And that's why he enslaved them. And in verse 19, Stephen now moved on to the oppression. Verse 19 says, the same dealt craftily with our race and ill-treated our fathers, that they should cast out their babes to the end they might not live. So the word craftily means to use craft or to use deceit. Uh, again, it's a Greek word used only once in the New Testament. So what we see back then was this new Pharaoh dealt very harshly with the people. And what he did was he issued a decree of death. And the decree of death was that all male babies were to be cast out or exposed. And the purpose of the exposure was to make certain that these babies recently born might not live. And that was infanticide. And it was about at this time, verse 20 says that Moses was born. At which season, verse 20, Moses was born and was exceeding fair. He was nourished three months in his father's house. So at the, at the time, sorry, no lights. I got the lights. So at the top, excuse me, there's some lights on. So uh, at the time of the decree for the death of the firstborn was issued at the time Moses was born. And when he was born, what happened was it was seen that he was exceedingly fair. Uh, he was, who was he exceedingly fair to? He was fair to God. Uh, and the word used to describe Moses is only used twice. And both times it was used in reference to Moses. It was used here. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23, he was fair. And this is a, this is a Hebraism where Luke was thinking in Hebrew, but writing in, in Greek. The, the Hebraism means that Moses was exceedingly fair in the eyes of God. And he was nourished for three months in his home. So he is brought up in his home in defiance of Pharaoh's decree to cast him out, to expose him to the elements to die. And so we see God's hand upon him here. And after three months, in verse 21, came the adoption of Moses. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. So he, after his cast, he had exposed on this little ark in the river. Pharaoh's daughter finds him, takes him up, and she adopted Moses as her son. And she nourished uh, and, and cared for him as her own child. And verse 22 summarizes his training in the royal house of Egypt. It says, Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mightily and he was mighty in his words and works. Now, we know from archaeology that the wisdom of Egypt included four specific areas of knowledge. We had science, astronomy, medicine, and mathematics. And these were the four areas of knowledge that Moses was trained in. And he used them all uh, within his, we see, the, we see the use of them all within the five books of the Old Testament. He was uh, mighty in both words and works. Uh, we see his might in the words in the, in the books of Exodus right through Deuteronomy. And we see his might in works in the way that God uses him in the, in the, uh, in the de deliverance in Exodus. Now, uh, one day, verse 23, one day Mo Moses now makes a decision. And we see the decision in verse 23. But when he was well nigh 40 years old, it came into his heart 
to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. So at the age of 40, he decides, it comes into his heart, he has a, he has a, he has a, a feeling in his heart, it, it, he has a desire in his heart, uh, it came from the lower depths of his nature, that's what the Greek means, and he makes this decision at age 40 that he is going to cease being identified with the royal house of Egypt, and he was going to identify himself with the Hebrews, the slaves. So he's come out of the royal house of Egypt, all the finest of luxury and everything, and he's now going to identify himself with the slaves. And we see in verse 23, he was going to visit his brethren. And uh, we see this then in Hebrews 11, 24 to 26 as well. Hebrews 11, 24 to 26. But the same point, at the same, at some point, sorry, he made a decision to now identify himself with the Jewish people and no longer with the Egyptians. And uh, it wasn't that long ago, I think. It wasn't a couple of weeks ago. Easter time, we had the Ten Commandments on with Charlton Heston. And there's a scene in, in, the, in the movie where Charlton Heston, discovered, who plays Moses, discovers he's a Hebrew at age 40 because of the blanket in which he was wrapped. That's not right. Moses always knew that he was Jewish. Who looked after him? Who was his, his wet nurse? His mother. So he always knew that he was Jewish. He didn't suddenly discover it as Charlton Heston did in the movie. And verses 24 to 28, Stephen recounts Israel's first rejection of Moses. And this was the first of two such rejections of Moses by Israel. And seeing one of them suffer, verse 24, seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed, smiting the Egyptian. So as Moses went out to make his identification public, he saw that an Egyptian overseer was mistreating a Jewish slave. And Moses interfered, he defended the Jewish slave. He avenged the one that was oppressed. And the Greek word uh, for being oppressed means to tire down with toil, to treat roughly. And so here it's being translated as being sore distressed or, or, or oppressed. Now, Moses strikes the Egyptian, and the Greek word means he, he, he smite him a deadly blow. So um, Moses strikes him to the point where the Egyptian died. And in verse 25, and he supposed, this is Moses, Moses supposed that his brethren understood that God by his hand was giving them deliverance, but they understood not. And the day following, the next day, the day following, he appeared unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Would you kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? So what we see here now is that the, the locals are going to reject him. According to verse 25, he supposed that his brethren understood that God was going to give him deliverance by his hand, but they didn't understand. Israel in slavery, misunderstood what Moses was, was trying to do. Moses simply thought that by his actions, the Jewish people would understand what he was trying to accomplish. By this time, Moses realized that God wanted him to use him to deliver Israel. But his timing was wrong. At least he knew his calling. He knew his calling, but his timing was a bit off. Only by 40 years. Now, the reason he wants to identify himself with his brethren was because he knew that his calling was to deliver Israel from Egypt. So he identified himself with Israel to the point of killing the Egyptian. However, Israel didn't understand what Moses understood. The misunderstanding of Israel led to the rejection of Moses by his own people. And what's, what Stephen is trying to do here, remember Stephen is talking to the Sanhedrin. What he's trying to show here is that just as Israel rejected Moses when he came to deliver them, the implication is that the same thing would happen to Jesus the Messiah. 
So that's why he's using Moses in his defense here. And verses 26 to 28 deal with the rejection of Moses by the Jewish people. And when Moses came again in verse 26 to the people, he again saw two more people fighting. It says, And the day following, he appeared unto them as they strove, and he wanted to bring peace between them. You know, stop this fighting. You guys are brothers, mate. Let's live, live life properly. So we have two fellow Jews who are fighting, and he wanted to make peace between the two. And Moses says, Hey, you guys are brethren. You're both fellow Jews. Why are you fighting against each other? And that's when the rejection comes. In verse 27, the rule of Moses over Israel was rejected. But he that did his neighbor wrong, the one who was at fault, pushed Moses away firmly. And he then raised, the, 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 the Jewish guy raised two rhetorical questions uh, to Moses. Uh, and these were both questions of rejection. First of all, he says, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? That's verse 27. What he was doing was he's implying here that nobody made Moses a ruler and a judge over them. And second, he says, are you going to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? So this man totally misunderstood the motivations of Moses and what he did on that day when he killed that Egyptian. So the rejection of Moses by his own people caused him to go away from them and now he departs and in verse 29 moses was in midian and moses fled at this saying and he became a sojourner in the land of midian where he begat two sons so at the statement of this jewish man uh, the fellow jewish man moses fled the country fled egypt and because he fled Egypt, he knew that he had been rejected by his own people. As a result, what happens? He becomes a sojourner. Uh, and it, sojourner simply means he's, he's a temporary resident. He's a temporary dweller down there in Midian. Um, <laughs> but his, his, temporary, his temporary dwelling is, as a temporary dweller, it only lasted 40 years. Uh, that's, that's some temporary dweller. So for 40 years, Moses lived down there in Midian, which is in the is South Sinai. And there he, he gets two sons, or he produces two sons. And when he, he now, after the 40 years, he's now 80 years old, he now has a burning bush experience. And we see this in verses 30 to 34. In verse 30, which says, When 40 years were fulfilled, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. So he's been down there 40 years at the age of 80. He's 80 now. Uh, Moses sees a very unusual sight. He, he saw a burning bush. It was not, it's not a totally unusual sight because uh, throughout uh, the South Sinai areas where the Bedouins live today, uh, these small bushes and, and the the Bedouin sheep and goats actually feed upon them. And because it's very dry in the South Sinai area with, with next to no rain, periodically the bushes will actually catch fire and burn. So burning bushes in the South Sinai were not that uncommon. But what's uncommon <laughs> is, a, is a burning bush which starts to speak to you and, and, and giving you orders uh, of, that would be very unusual, a bush that's, that speaks, a bit like Balaam's donkey that spoke. But so, so Moses, he saw both the usual, the bush which had caught fire, and the unusual. The usual was a burning bush, but the unusual was that it continued burning and burning, and it wasn't consumed. It was just flame. And then a voice spoke to him out of the bush. And... Uh, it tells us here that the voice was the angel of Jehovah, uh, which is the second person of uh, the triunity, the Trinity. So the burning bush was at Mount Sinai itself. At Mount Sinai, Moses now receives his call. And at Mount Sinai, Moses would fulfill his call when he brought Israel to Mount Sinai. And the point of verse 30 
is that God was, again, remember, this is, this is Stephen's defense to the Sanhedrin. The point of verse 30 is that God was free to reveal himself how and where he wished. He was not confined to the land of Israel. He was not confined to the temple. So where, where Moses had this revelation, it was outside the borders of, of the land. And there was no tabernacle or temple at this time. So God was free to reveal himself in, in, any, in any way and in any place. He's not confined. Even in the south of Sinai, in the form of a burning bush, he can reveal himself. And we see now the response, and this is, this, is, this is Stephen's argument to, in his defense to the Sanhedrin. And we see the response of Moses in verse 31. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight. And as he drew near to behold, there came a voice of the Lord. So when Moses observed this, he was filled with wonder and bewilderment at what he was seeing. I mean, so would most of us. It would be very unusual. And we see God's response in verses 31 to 32. As Moses began to approach this bush to get a better look at it, as to why it was burning and yet not being consumed, the voice spoke to him. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and durst not behold. Uh, this is in verses 31 to 32. Notice here the identification of the speaker. It says it was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But we just saw back in, in verse 30, it was the angel of Jehovah. And God himself is mentioned in verses 31 to 32. So this shows us that the angel of Jehovah is God himself, and specifically the second person of the Trinity. By referring to himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's referring to himself as the one who made the covenant with Abraham. Remember, God made the Abrahamic covenant with Abraham, confirmed it with Isaac and Jacob. Uh, the Abrahamic covenant not only predicted four centuries of Egyptian slavery, but also promised redemption from Egypt. So on the basis of the Abrahamic covenant, Moses was now called to fulfill the mission he thought he would carry out 40 years earlier. Moses understood his calling, but his timing was askew, was off. And the response of Moses in verse 30 is one of trembling. You know, Moses became terrified. He was so terrified that he, he didn't even dare to look at the burning bush. As you and I would be terrified if you saw a bush burning, not being, not being consumed, and a voice speaks out of it. Uh, we'd be pretty terrified as well. And now the Lord said unto him, Loose the shoes from off your feet. For the place whereon you stand is holy ground. Verse 34. I have surely seen the affliction of my, of my people that is in Egypt and have heard their groaning. And I'm come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you into Egypt. So in verses 33 to 34, God now gave Moses a further message. First, in the, in the near future, in the immediate future, take your shoes off your feet. Take your shoes off your feet. Why? Because the ground in which you're standing is holy ground. The ground is called holy, even though it was outside the borders of what we call the Holy Land, Israel. Anywhere that God appears is an area of holiness. It is possible to have holy ground outside the borders of the land. Again, Stephen defending himself. Uh, and Mount Sinai is definitely outside the borders of the Holy Land. So Stephen is, is constantly tries to make the point to the Sanhedrin uh, that God's blessings are not limited to the land of Israel or to the temple. And this was true even in Old Testament history. And this principle is extended even further in the New Testament. So the second thing 
with God, God speaking out of the bush. In, he says, in the future, Moses, you're going to deliver Israel from the Egyptians. In verse 34, he says, I have surely seen, says God, I've surely seen. Again, uh, you, Luke uses a Hebraism here. It's very emphatic. It's, it, in Hebrew, it's, it's having seen, I have indeed, I have indeed seen. So having seen, I have indeed seen. So what uh, God has indeed seen is the affliction of Israel in Egypt. He saw that they were being treated evilly. And God has also heard the groanings of the Jews. And God has now come down to deliver Israel. And how's God going to deliver them? He's going to deliver them by the means of a mediator, a go-between. And the, the go between the mediator in this case is going to be the man Moses. Now, just as it was the case with, as in, was in, just as was in the case with Joseph, so it's going to be in the case of Moses as well, because in verse thirty-five, what we see is that the rejected one Moses now becomes the savior of the ones who rejected him. Verse 35 says, This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? Him had God, God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the hand of the angel that appeared to him in the bush. Um, as we get through the next few verses, you're going to see that Stephen is going to continue to emphasize this Moses, this man, this Moses. And he's going to emphasize the word this about Moses. What's he trying to do? He's trying to drive home the point to the Sanhedrin. Uh, he's trying to drive home to the point to the Sanhedrin about this man, Moses. This man, this man who came as a deliverer was rejected the first time, but he delivered them the second time. So the very man, the very man that Israel rejected is the very same individual that God used to deliver Israel out of Egypt. And in verse 35, the Greek word for deliverer means redeemer. It's, it, is a, it is used a word uh, only here and nowhere else. It's used only here and nowhere else, this word. Moses would not deliver alone. He would have the aid of the same angel who appeared in the bush. And again, the angel of Jehovah is the second person of the triunity, the trinity. Verse 36 emphasizes or summarizes the exodus it says this man led them forth having wrought wonders and signs in egypt and in the red sea and in the wilderness 40 years this man which man moses this man moses the rejected one led them forth this is the man who did signs and wonders both in the land of Egypt with the ten plagues and by the Red Sea when he divided the waters and in the wilderness for the next 40 years when he did signs and wonders. That same man that they had earlier rejected, he now becomes a savior of the nation. He's trying to let the penny drop with these, the Sanhedrin group. Uh, can't you see, guys, that you know, the one that you are trying to reject here or have rejected, this is the Savior. And in verse 37, Stephen now falls back upon one of Moses' several prophecies. He says, this is that Moses who said unto the children of Israel, a prophet shall God raise up unto you from among your brethren like unto me. It's this same Moses who was rejected and then became the savior of the rejectors. And that same man predicted in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, that God would raise up another prophet like unto Moses. He'll be unto them. He'll be unto the people. He'll be a prophet to Israel. He'll be a Jewish prophet. He'll be like unto Moses who spoke with God face to face. The implication that Stephen is drawing here is that Jesus of Nazareth is the prophet of Deuteronomy 18.15. He is the prophet like unto Moses. And, and the, the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders, 
couldn't understand this. And yet there was one Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4 who realized, she said to Jesus, are you the prophet, the prophet that Moses spoke about? And he was. Now, in verse 38, Stephen now deals with the giving of the law. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel that spoke to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received living oracles to give unto us. So it is, it is this same Moses that was with, with the congregation of Israel in the wilderness. And uh, see, some translators use the word church in this verse. Uh, and there are certain segments of theology today that like to show so that, hey, see, the church was, uh, was already in existence and Israel and the church are the same. But they miss the fact here that Stephen is using the Septuagint and the Hebrew word for congregation is translated by the word ecclesia in the Septuagint. And, and this word is simply used in a non-technical sense here. It's, it's not used as the body of Christ. Later on in the book of Acts, uh, we're going to see the term ecclesia concerning the massive assembly of the Ephesians. And the Ephesians, that was a pagan assembly. So um, uh, those who claim that Israel and the church are one and the same, they don't, uh, <laughs> they don't use ecclesia down there later on in the book of Acts when it speaks about the pagans of, of, of Ephesus. Uh, they don't attempt to make that the church down there, even though it's the same word. So a better translation of verse 38 is not the church in the wilderness, but the congregation in the wilderness. And in verse 38, with the angel that now speaks to him on Mount Sinai, Moses now received the law of Moses. Exodus itself never says that Moses received the law through the mediation of angels. But Jewish tradition says that was true. And this is actually one Jewish uh, tradition that's reaffirmed by the New Testament. It's reaffirmed here and also in Galatians chapter 3 verse 19 and Hebrews chapter 2 verse 2. So these two clear uh, propositional statements say that Moses received the law by means of angels. So by means of angels in the wilderness, Moses received living oracles to give unto us. Um, Moses received the Ten Commandments on, on the tablets of stone on Mount Sinai, but the, the other um, 603 commandments he received through angels. Uh, the Greek word for living oracles literally means divine words. Um, divine words. It, it's used uh, in Acts 7.38, referring to the Ten Commandments, which is where we are now. Um, second, uh, in Romans 3.2, uh, referring to the substance of the law and the prophets. And third, Hebrews 5.12, to describe the substance of Christ's teachings from the viewpoint of the New Testament. And um, fourth in 1 Peter 4.11, where it's used of, uh, of the one who speaks the oracles of God. I knew you were interested in all this, this um, references. So by tracing the four usages, the point is this, that the New Testament is of equal inspiration as the Old Testament. That's what... Uh, that's what um, Stephen is, is, is pointing to here. Okay. Now, while Moses is, is on top of Mount Sinai, receiving these things in verses 39 to 41, we have the second rejection of Moses by Israel. In verse uh, 39, uh, we have, it says, to whom our fathers would not be obedient, but thrust him from them and turn back in their hearts onto Egypt. Uh, when did they do that? Well, while he was up on the mountain, he was up there for uh, 40 days, uh, and the people were now disobedient to him. Uh, it says they thrust him from them. Um, and this is the same terminology was used in verse 27 of the fellow Jew who pushed Moses away. In verse 37, uh, 27, it was, a, it was a literal thrusting aside, get out of the way, you know, get away from us here. And in verse 39, it's more of a, a mental uh, thrusting aside. We've finished with that Moses guy. We, we have nothing to do with him anymore. So what they do is they turn their backs on Moses and they turn their hearts back to Egypt. 
uh, and the means by which they rejected Moses in verse 89, we've seen 40 to 41, the golden calf. In verse 40, they made the request to Moses' his own brother Aaron, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses who led us forth out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. So when Stephen said, as for this Moses, uh, he meant it in an honorable way. But when the people said it, they meant it in a way of contempt. This Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know where he is. What, what's he gone and done? We don't know where he is. And so what they requested, they received in verse 41. They made a calf in those days, brought a sacrifice onto the idol, and they rejoiced in the works of their hands. They made the idol of the golden calf, sacrificed to it, and rejoiced in the work of their hands. And the Greek tense means that they kept on rejoicing and making merry at what they had done. Uh, and, and this single act of idolatry in the wilderness now leads to further acts of idolatry in the wilderness wanderings. And we're going to see that they are pretty active in their, in their uh, worshipping of, of false gods. In verses 42 to 43, he deals with a long history of Israel's idolatries during that time of 40 years and beyond. But God turned and gave them up to serve the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer unto me slain beasts and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? And you took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of the god Rephan, the figures which you made to worship them. And I'll carry you away beyond Babylon. So God's response was to give them up to idolatry. So basically in verses 42 to 43, he summarizes the remainder of Israel's history and their tendency toward idolatry. And eventually, this tendency toward idolatry brought on the Babylonian captivity. They especially began in verse 42 to serve the host of heaven. It's a star worship. And to prove... Stephen, to prove his point, he quotes from Amos chapter 5, verses 25 to 27. Uh, notice what he said. Notice what Stephen says here. Uh, uh, it is written in the book, singular, of the prophets, plural. In the, in the Jewish order of the 12 minor prophets, uh, in, um, they're not viewed as 12 separate books, they're, they're, uh, as we view it but as one singular book or one scroll of the 12 prophets. So the one book that he's referring to here is the 12, the one book of the 12. That's why Stephen uses it as one book, but plural, one single book, but plural prophets. And, and he quotes from Amos 5. It's a simple quotation, but he proves his point. What, he's, what he does, he proves his point that what he's accusing Israel of is something that the prophets have already accused them of. You guys are already doing this sort of stuff. Nothing new. Uh, and the prophets accused them of idolatry. And the question is raised. When you made all these sacrifices in the wilderness for 40 years, did you actually sacrifice unto me? This is God asking the question. According to Amos, while the Jews sacrificed often throughout the 40 years of wilderness wanderings, Frequently, the sacrifices were not made to the God of Israel, but to idols. And they were made to two idols in particular. Moloch. Uh, Mol Moloch. Or Moloch was the Ammonite star god. And he was associated with the planet Venus. And, and he's a guy who is similar or equal to the Greek god Venus. And this was the god to whom human sacrifices were offered. Uh, and the other god that they worshipped was Raphan or, or Ramfa, and this is the Babylonian god uh, connected with the planet Saturn. So they're worshipping the, the things in the heavens. So the sacrifices that Israel offered were sacrifices that, that God commanded, but they diverted these sacrifices to these uh, astral gods. And the point is that idolatry is that the idolatry that began with the golden calf 
now found its climax with the worship of the host of the heaven of the stars or the stars. So what we see here is that uh, they started off with a golden calf and they ended up with the stars in heaven, worshiping them. And this is seen throughout the scriptures. Uh, we see it in Deuteronomy 17.3, 2 Kings 17.6 and 21.3 in verse 5. Chapter 23, 5 of 2 Kings, 2 Chronicles 33, 3, 5, Jeremiah 19, 13. So it's spread right throughout the Jewish history. So what Stephen is trying to get across here uh, to the Sanhedrin is, first of all, God began fulfilling the Abrahamic covenant by bringing Israel out of the land. Second, Israel proved disobedient. Third, God's revelation and his great works were done outside the land. They were done in Egypt, Sinai, and the wilderness. Fourth, the rejected one, Moses, actually became the savior of the rejectors, Israel. Fifth, Israel consistently was guilty of idolatry from beginning to end. And sixth, there was a promise of a future prophet to arise like unto Moses. <clears throat> okay, we now look at the tabernacle. The tabernacle, verses 44 to 50. Our fathers had the tabernacle of the testimony in the wilderness, even as he appointed who spoke unto Moses, that he should make it according to the figure that he had seen which also our fathers in their turn brought in with Joshua when they entered on the possession of the nations, that God thrust out before the face of our fathers onto the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a habitation for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. Howbeit the most high dwelled not in houses made with hands, as said the prophet, the heaven is my throne, the earth the footstool of my feet. What manner of house will you build me, said the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? So we see the tabernacle described in 44 to, 44 to 50, chapter 7. In verse 44, he begins by dealing with the construction of the tabernacle. The tabernacle was built by the fathers outside the land of Israel. It was built in the wilderness outside. And also, it was even as he appointed, as God appointed. So this was God's will and God's commands to build a tabernacle in the wilderness. Also, God did not tell Moses to make it any way he chose. Moses had to follow a specific pattern. He had to follow the pattern of what he had seen. So where did he see it? Obviously on Mount Sinai, God gave Moses a vision of the tabernacle in heaven. And Moses was to make the earthly tabernacle as an exact duplicate of the heavenly one. And the Greek word for pattern is where we get our English word type. And the Greek word means to strike or to make an imprint with a blow. And it deals with the impression and with the model of the blow itself. Moses saw the original tabernacle while on Mount Sinai, and therefore he was able to tell the people how to build the model or the type. And then in verses 45 to 46, he now summarizes the history of the tabernacle from Joshua to David, which also our fathers in their turn brought in. Uh, and the Greek word for in their turn, and he used once here, the King James Version in verse 45 uses the name Jesus instead of Joshua. Um, so if you've got a King James Version, you'll see Jesus there. Uh, and the Greek word for Jesus is Iesus, uh, Iesus, uh, and the Greek word for Joshua, also the same, Iesus. On, although in English, uh, Joshua and Jesus seem to be different names. In Greek, they're actually the same names. So Jesus was actually Joshua. And that's why the King James Version translated it as Jesus in verse 45. Uh, it refers to, the, to the, the actual Joshua of the Old Testament, not to Jesus. Now, this tabernacle fully entered uh, the borders of the promised land when the Jewish people 
entered on the possession of the nations. These other nations were pushed out um, for their fathers. And the tabernacle lasted until the days of King David. And, and David found favor in the sight of God. David asked God, can I build a temple? Can I build a habitation for you, O God? Uh, but David was not allowed to build the temple for the Lord. In fact, in verse 47, uh, it was Solomon who was finally allowed to build a permanent structure. Uh, and with Solomon is the beginning of temple history and the end of tabernacle history. But having built a temple in verse 48 to, 40, 48 to 50, Stephen spells out where God actually dwells. And he does not dwell. It says, verse 48, How be it the most high... Does, does not uh, dwelleth not in houses made with hands, as saith the prophet. However, in contrast to what David and Solomon plan, that's not precise. That is not precisely what took place. The word "not" in the Greek tense is in the emphatic position. Literally, it reads, "But not does the Most High." In no, what he's saying is, in no way is God confined uh, to a physical building. Whether it is the small tabernacle or the great temple, God is not confined to a physical building. Don't be mistaken about it. The Shekinah glory was within the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and in the temple. But that doesn't mean God was, it doesn't mean God was confined to that area. Uh, God is simply too great to be limited to one small room in the small tabernacle or the great temple. He, God cannot be confined to a room. And to prove it, uh, remember, he's talking to the Sanhedrin. He's saying to them, listen, God is not confined to the temple here in Jerusalem. He's not confined to the Holy of Holies. And to prove it, verse 48 to 50, it says, The heaven is my throne and the earth the footstool of my feet. What manner of house will you build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? And here he's quoting from Isaiah 66, verses 1 to 2. And this was a, a, um, a literal prophecy, and, and Stephen is making an application of this literal prophecy. The literal prophecy is that Isaiah 66, 1 to 2, speaks of the third Jewish temple, which is a temple of the Great Tribulation. Um, uh, that is the only one of the four temples of Scripture that will not be accepted by God. It's the third temple, the temple that Isaiah prophesied about in Isaiah 66, uh, verses 1 and onwards. First and second temples were acceptable to God. Fourth temple will also be acceptable to God. But the third temple in Jerusalem, the temple of the Great Tribulation, will not be acceptable to God. And that's the point of Isaiah 66, 1 to 2. And that is the literal meaning of Isaiah 66. The application here is the similarity that God cannot be confined to one building. God's too big for that. It's a bit of a summary. Stephen says in verses 44 to 50, first of all, the tabernacle was built outside the land of Israel. What's, what's the reason for that? It's to show that the divine presence of God was not confined to the land. Second, although God did command both the tabernacle and the temple to be built, it was not for the purpose of confining God's presence. Third thing, God was still free to work and to appear anywhere that he desired. And fourth, the implication he's trying to make is that the new faith which he's proclaiming, it's not confined. It is universal. It is going to be everywhere. All right. And we see the accusation, the accusation in verse 51. You, <laughs> this is um, Stephen talking to the Sanhedrin. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? And they killed them that showed before of the coming of the righteous one, of whom you have now become betrayers and murderers. 
you who receive the law as it was ordained by angels and kept it not. So Stephen, after he's gone through this uh, history, uh, a very basic history of the Old Testament and showing how Israel failed, Stephen now becomes the accuser. And the point is that this generation of Israel is guilty of the same sin. This generation of Israel has also resisted the Holy Spirit, as did the generation in the wilderness. And without, without uh, beating around the bush, <laughs> Stephen looked at the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leaders, all 71 or so members, and said, you stiff-necked, un uncircumcised in heart and ears. Uh, and and the, the Greek word for stiff neck simply means you, you, hard, you, have, you have hard neck. Your neck is so rigid. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, it's used once in the New Testament, but uh, we see it throughout the Old Testament. Uh, we see it in Exodus 32, 9, Exodus 33, 3 to 5, Exodus 34, 9, Deuteronomy 9 to 6. They all make similar points. Uh, they're stiff necked. They're hard-necked, and the Greek word for uncircumcised is also used once, but going back into the Old Testament, we see it in Leviticus 26, 41, Deuteronomy 10, 16, uh, they're on your screen, Jeremiah 4, 4, 6, 10, 9, 26. So what Stephen is doing, he's accusing the Sanhedrin of always resisting the Holy Spirit. Um, he points out that they're doing exactly the same thing that their fathers did. And their fathers were accused of resisting the spirit back in Isaiah chapter 63, verse 10. Isaiah, the prophet, accused Israel of resisting the spirit. And they're guilty of the very same sin. And he's going to point out in the following verses, they're also guilty of killing the Messiah. You do the same thing. In verse 52, which of the prophets did not your fathers persecute? And they killed them that showed before the coming of the righteous one, of whom you have now become betrayers and murderers. The generation to whom he's speaking is guilty of killing the prophet like unto Moses. The prophet that Moses predicted was going to come. And Moses predicted that they hear him, listen to what he's saying. Instead, they killed him. And so he reminds them of the history when he says, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? The fact that Israel has a long history of persecuting the prophets is taught in the Old Testament. Second Chronicles 36 verses 15 to 16. Because of the killing of the prophets, the Babylonian captivity came. And the accusation that Stephen is, makes here is the same accusation that Jesus makes in Matthew 23, Matthew 23, 29 to 36, and Luke 11, 47 to 51. Luke 11, 47 to 51. They killed the very prophets who spoke in advance of the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah. The word coming is specific. It is the coming. And this is of this one who came as a righteous one, they betrayed. Like Judas Iscariot, so the Sanhedrin also betrayed the righteous one. They betrayed him, and what happened was they became his murderers. So he's not beating around the bush. I guess Stephen can, is considering, well, I know what my faith is, so I might as well give him the whole shebang. And in verse 53, you who received the law as it was ordained by angels and kept it not, he concludes by pointing out that they are without excuse because they had the law. The law was ordained by Moses. For the second time in the chapter, we're told that the law came by means of angels. Again, this is reaffirmed by Galatians, Galatians 3.19 and Hebrews 2.2. 2. They had the law ordained by angels. They should have known better. They should have read the law and known better. And, uh, because they should have known better and it did not, the text says they kept it not. What did they keep not? They didn't keep the law. We know that they didn't keep the law. We can, know, we can know that they did not keep the law. Why? Because they rejected Jesus as the Messiah. If they had kept the law, they would have accepted Jesus as the Messiah. 
But when they rejected Jesus, that was a clear violation of the law. Closing statements of Stephen, of, of verses 51 to 53. First, the present generation has done exactly what the Father has done. The present generation has killed the prophets and the, one, and the, and the prophet in particular. Second, these last three verses here are a denunciation of the leadership of that specific generation. Third, there was no offer of salvation in these verses. There was only a declaration of disobedience. And with verse 53, we come to the end of Stephen's speech. Five things about his speech. First thing, in his speech, we remember we spoke about he was telescoping events. He telescopes the two cores of Abraham. He telescopes two purchases of the, of the field. He telescopes Hebron by Abraham, Shechem by Jacob, the caves. Third, he telescopes the two burials. He telescopes the burial of Jacob in Hebron, Joseph in Shechem. Remember, he got them all mixed up. Second, Jesus is not prominent in this speech as he was in the speeches of Peter. Uh, in fact, Jesus is not even introduced until verse 53. Even then, he is not introduced by name, but by a title, the righteous one, the righteous one. Third observation, he does not mention the resurrection of Jesus because that was a major issue in, in this context. It was not a major issue in this context. Remember, previously, the big issue was the resurrection of Jesus because the, the Sadducees do not believe in the resurrection. So that was an issue which aroused, stirred up the, the Sadducees earlier on, but he doesn't mention it at all now. The Sadducees were guilty of instigating the first and second persecutions, but this third persecution was instigated by the Pharisees. The issue was not resurrection here, but it was Stephen's words concerning the nature of God, who the Messiah is, the temple and the law. Fourth observation. Stephen was accused of two specific issues. First, disrespect to the temple. Second, disrespect to the law, Mosaic law. Notice, he never answers any of these allegations. He doesn't answer any of these charges in his speech. He wasn't concerned with answering the charges against him. He was simply interested in presenting the truth as it is written. Fifth, Stephen made five specific points. First of all, there is both progress and change in God's program. Second, God's blessings are not limited to the land of Israel or the temple compound. He's outside of that. Third, Israel has consistently rejected God's plan and God's messengers. And fourth, nevertheless, the rejected one often became the savior of the rejecters. And that will be Jesus at the second coming. He will, he will be the savior of the ones who initially rejected him, the nation. Okay, what's the implication? The same thing's going to be true of the Messiah. And he refers here to the Messiah as a righteous one. He was rejected by Israel, but he is now destined to become the savior of the rejectors in the future. And that is your lot for today. I hope you enjoyed it.